Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Bipin from SIPSI Wellington. Welcome to this webinar on passive house buildings. The webinar shall last for 60 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. This webinar will help learn the main principles of designing sustainable, comfortable, and affordable passive house buildings. The speakers of this event are Anton and Svetlin from the Passive House School. Svetlin is a PHI accredited Passive House certifier. He has trained more than 200 students from over 12 countries. He has built Bulgaria's first Passive House Classic and is now living there. And Anton is one of the youngest across the world to become a certified Passive House consultant. He got certified when he was 16. He is currently studying Master of Architecture and along with Svetlin runs the Passive House School. While waiting for other delegates to join, I shall walk you all through a few of SIPSI's initiatives. So we are offering a membership for 17 months as an affiliate or a graduate at the price of 12 months. And uh, the benefits of the membership includes a subscription to the SIPSI journal. It includes unlimited free downloads of all building services knowledge guides, as well as the ANZ regional quarterly um, publication, which is called Engineering Buildings Journal. It also includes several benefits like uh, an ability to gain professional recognition like CNs or INs. We also invite all of you to register for the SIPSI ANZ annual virtual seminar, which is titled as 2020 Vision for a 2030 Reality. Uh, this webinar will bring experts from both sides of the Tasman to share exemplar case studies of regenerative and net zero building practices. The webinar shall also provide new information on future policy changes that building owners and service engineers need to understand in order to minimize future risks to assets, both existing and new. This event now offers up to eight hours of CPD live and to take away. In addition to 10 presentations, this event will offer the delegates the opportunity to learn from additional international case studies and other net zero webinars. Speed network in small breakout groups is also possible during the webinar, which I think is excellent. And uh, you can register for the event at sipsi.org.au. And uh, as a SIPSI ANZ webinar attendee, we know you appreciate the value of the content provided by SIPSI webinars. So for a limited time, we would like to offer you an additional saving of up to $1.120 with a $109 ticket to this event. So register by Friday, August 14th, using the promo code event loyalty offer uh, which you can see in the slide, you know, to secure your ticket. We are also offering free tickets to SIPSI student members. So all students, uh, we invite you to sign up at sipsi.org slash student. So um, before beginning the webinar, I'd like to let you know that this session is being recorded and the recording shall be shared with you all along with the CPD certificate uh, in a week time. Also, we encourage you to use the Q&A box for all your questions, and all those will be answered during the Q&A session. I'm now handing over the session to Andon. Uh, the space is all yours, all the best. Thank you, Bipin. Good evening to everyone. It's morning for me. We're joining here from, from Bulgaria, from the Passive House School. And welcome to this presentation. Let me just start sharing my screen. So before we start with the presentation, I would like to tell you a bit more about the, the Passive House School. Um, firstly, the Passive House School started as part of Passive House Bulgaria. Svetlin is the founder of uh, Passive House Bulgaria. And in the beginning, we started making international courses, but then we made the Passive House School so that we can focus purely on international education. And um, also online education. Our mission is to make the Passive House standard the main and leading standard for energy efficiency uh, for the building sector globally. And what we've achieved until now is that we have, we've had more than 200 students at the Certified Passive House Designer courses 
from over 14 countries already. We have uh, currently nine ongoing Pascal's projects, certifications, consultations as well. And uh, as Bipin mentioned there, uh, Svetlin has already more than 10 years of experience in the Pascal's field and more than 25 years of experience in the, in the construction field in general. Uh, and also many of the certified Pascal's designers in these, uh, from these 14 countries, they, were, they also became the first ones in their country. So that's also something that we're uh, really proud of. And now, before we start with the presentation, I would like to ask you a few, uh, few questions. So I'll launch the first question. The question is, which of the following do you think consumes most energy in standard buildings? Hot water, appliances, lights, or heating? The answers are coming in. Few more seconds. All right. So, we'll share the results with you guys. Um, you're right, most of the energy in, in standard buildings is used for, uh, for heating. Um, let's now see the, the second question. The second question is, when the outdoor air humidity is too high, we should use an energy recovery ventilation system or a heat recovery ventilation system? Just to restart sharing. All right, I'll end it in three, two, one. Let's see the results. So as you can see, most of you answered that it's energy recovery ventilation. During this lecture, during this webinar, I hope you'll find out what the right answer is, whether it's uh, ERV or HRV. And now the last question before we start with the presentation. The last question is, windows facing the north, that's for the southern hemisphere, should have horizontal shading elements, vertical shading elements, or no shading elements. Okay, let's have a few more seconds. All right, so we'll share the results with you. Most of you answered that th these are the horizontal shading elements and you see during the lecture uh, whether that's true or, uh, or not. Now, let's guys move into the, into the presentation. What we're gonna talk about today is firstly, we'll start with the why passive. So why is the passive house standard the solution? Then we'll look into the history of the passive house standard. Uh, we will see what the passive house standard is and what the passive house certification criteria are. Then we'll look into the passive house design principles. So what principles do you have to follow in order to design a passive house building? Then we'll see some principles for heating and cooling of passive house buildings. And last but not least, we'll look into the economics of passive house buildings. So, Let's start with why passive. One of the biggest challenges that humankind is facing in the 21st century is global warming. And according to, to the research results, it is necessary to limit the global temperature increase up to two Kelvins. And as you can see on this slide, the temperature of the earth has drastically increased uh, in the last around 100 years. And currently the global temperature increase is uh, around one degree Celsius. Uh, this you can check on the, on, uh, this is data from NASA website. I checked yesterday. And to limit the temperature increase to 2 to 2.5 Kelvins is still possible. However, we should take immediate action. On the right diagram of this slide, you can see what the global energy demand by sector is. And this is based on a study by the, uh, done by the International Energy Agency. And keep in mind that only 12% of this energy comes from renewable resources. As you can see, the building sector has the highest energy demand globally with 34%. Uh, then, then comes the industry with 28, then comes the transport with 27, but in general, the building sector has the highest stake in that. Um, 
in order to fight climate change, reduction of carbon emissions should be a priority for each economic sector. But as building professionals, what can we do in order, uh, or what can we do in order to limit this in the in the building sector? Um, firstly, we can reduce the emissions created by buildings. In other words, to reduce the energy demand of the uh, of the buildings themselves. Then uh, we can increase the renewable energy production, right? Because renewable energy is sustainable. That's why if we increase the amount of uh, of renewable energy that we produce, we're gonna uh, more or less also contribute to solving this challenge that we uh, that we're facing. Then the third point that you can see is carbon capture and storage. That's a technology from which carbon is captured from the from the atmosphere and then it is stored in one or another way. On the bigger scale, it is possible to do it, uh, to store carbon. There are huge facilities under the ground. On the smaller scale, uh, we can store carbon in the building by using, for example, wood for the structure or COT, that's cross laminated timber. So these are uh, all different ways to, uh, to use this technology. And then last but not least is to use sustainably sourced, ma sourced materials and building processes. So by having a more sustainable production method and also by having um, more uh, sustainable building or to, to construct the building on site in a more sustainable way uh, to save on, on transportation, et cetera, et cetera. We also reduce these uh, greenhouse gas emissions by the building sector. But let's now look into how does this look like on the scale of a building? Uh, what we concluded now is that one of the biggest challenges, so what we concluded up until now is that one of the biggest challenges that humankind has to solve in the 21st century is global warming. Then global warming is caused by the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and these greenhouse gas emissions come mostly from the energy that we use. And most of the energy, as we saw in the previous slide, is used by the building sector. So let's now look into what is this energy actually used for. And as you can see on the diagram on the right, 45% of the energy is used for heating. And I just want to mention uh, that this is based on the global research. So 45% is used for heating, then comes hot water with 18%. Uh, then we have uh, cooling with 9%, light with uh, 6%, et etc. And all in all, 72% of the total consumed energy is used for heating and cooling, both space and water. And there's a huge there's a huge potential for optimization of the energy consumption in buildings in general. So there, because of this huge potential for optimization, uh, basically that's what the passive house buildings do. They optimize the energy use in the, in the building and the passive house standard is the only building standard that purely focuses on energy efficiency. So what do passive house buildings do? They reduce the energy usage for space heating and cooling. They reduce the heat losses by optimizing the building envelope. Uh, we have high quality window frames and glazing, again, in order to uh, maximize the solar gains during the winter, but also to reduce the, the heat losses. A reduction of the thermal bridges, that's in order to have a more optimized building envelope. Reduced heat loss from leakages through the building envelope, in our words, to have an airtight building to reduce the heat losses through the ventilation system. Passive house buildings increase the solar heat gains in the winter and also reduction of the frequency of overheating by means of permanent and temporary shading, which is also really important for uh, climate zones like New Zealand and Australia. Uh, furthermore, passive house buildings, they can use renewable energy resources. We can have solar panels for the domestic hot water. We can have heat pumps and also uh, PV panels or wind turbines for uh, renewable uh, energy production. So, sorry, the passive house standard unites all these roads driven by profitability and comfort. So passive house buildings, they're not only sustainable, they're not only energy efficient, but they're also extremely comfortable and they're also really economic because when we design a passive house building, we can choose and we can, um, we can compare different variations and we can go and choose the most cost optimal design based on, uh, based on our goals. And also 
the passive house is the first step to net zero. That's also how the webinar is called, right? So we should focus on energy efficiency first and cover the remaining demand by generation, uh, by generating renewable energy on site. And why so? Because uh, as you can see on this slide, for example, if we have a 150 square meter house, this would use 1, 000, uh, or 11,250 kilowatt hours per year. And if we have a passive house building, uh, this will result in 80% energy reduction for heating and cooling. So this is around 2,250 um, kilowatt hours per uh, year. And that's for the same uh, house, again, 150 square meters. And of course, it is much easier to cover the 2,250 kilowatt hours per year than to cover the demand of the standard building. That's why we say that we should focus on energy efficiency first and then cover the remaining demand with renewable uh, production on site. And furthermore, the, of course, the question is going to be, yeah, but isn't it more expensive? Expensive. Well, at the end of this lecture, at the end of this uh, presentation, you will see whether it is or not. Um, the main factors in the decision making process of designers, investors, etc., and in general building professionals uh, in the building sector it are profitability, comfort, and sustainability. And the passive house standard, it unites all these principles. Um, so this is the first and only building standard that combines the personal interest and desires of the individual with the public need for uh, environmental protection. So the, the, the personal interests and desires are to have an economic building and also to have a comfortable building. And it combines it with the public need for environmental protection because uh, passive house buildings are extremely energy efficient. So we're talking about passive house buildings, but what are passive house buildings? Like how, when did everything start and what is the history of the passive house standard? On this slide, you can see the first uh, passive house building, which was built in Darmstadt, Kranichstein, uh, Germany. And just before telling you a bit more about this house, I want to tell you what the backstory is. So in the 1970s, uh, there was a huge oil crisis in the US. I personally haven't, uh, I wasn't born back then, but I believe the fact. So uh, there was a huge oil crisis and people, professionals, researchers started developing concepts into how can we become independent from oil. And that's also the time when concepts like super insulated homes and also passive solar homes started developing. Then in 1988, uh, Dr. Wolfgang Feist and Bo Adamson, they started doing research. Um, and research of how can we make really energy efficient buildings. So they, they, they combined more or less all this research and they, they further research um, in order to come up with the passive house standard. Um, and then in 1989, they combined this research with the design. So they started designing a real building. It's like a case study building. And then in 1990, they started with the construction of this building. And in 1991, four families moved in. And since then, already almost 30 years, uh, these families have been living in this uh, building, in this passive house building, and the building performs exactly the same way as it used to perform in the beginning. And which is this building? This is the building that you can see on this slide. That's the first passive house building. It uses 90% less energy for heating compared to the traditional buildings in, in Germany. There is no active heating system in this building. And uh, there has been constant monitoring of the building that shows that for the last 29 years, it still performs uh, and works flawlessly. And the properties of the building elements haven't deteriorated with time as well. Um, and here you can see Dr. Vogan Feist. Uh, he is like the, the father of the passive house standard. He's the person who, who started everything. And he also created the so-called Passive House Institute in 1996. Uh, this institute is in, Germ in Darmstadt, Germany, and uh, they're also, uh, yeah, they're, they're also the people who are, who are responsible for this, uh, for this standard and who are further developing the standard uh, even nowadays. And now I'll tell you a bit more about the Passive House standard. Firstly, what are the Passive House certification criteria? 
um, we differentiate between two different uh, criteria. One is based on PHPP calculations, and the second criteria is based on physical testing. Uh, what does PHPP stand for? That's the Passive House Planning Package. That's the software that we, the Passive House designers, use to make our building models and to make uh, um, a model of our of, of the whole building. And um, Passive house buildings, then they can be also certified that, that they have to meet. So the first criteria is to have space heating demand, which is below 15 kilowatt hours per square meter annually. Then we have uh, an alternative criteria, which is for the heating load, uh, namely that the heating load should be 10 watts uh, below 10 watts per uh, square meter. And the thing is that if you meet the space heating demand, criteria, then you don't have to meet per se the heating load criteria and vice versa as well. The same goes for the cooling demand. So the space cooling demand should be below 15 kilowatt hours per square meter annually, or the cooling load should be below 10 watts per square meter. I'll just give you a brief example. For example, if you have a building in a really, really warm climate, well, in that case, uh, you, you wouldn't be able to meet the space cooling demand because you would need cooling throughout the whole year. And that's why we have this alternative criteria and then you have to meet the cooling load criteria. Then we have another criteria, which is for, for the primary energy renewable. So that's a building. And this is, uh, this should be below 60 kilowatt hours per square meter anterior, which is based on physical testing. And that's for the air pressure difference should be below 0 0.6 per hour or in other words also called N50 should be below 0 0.6 per hour um, uh, after the building is already constructed and built and the passive house standard is an international climate independent energy efficiency building standard for the misconception that the Pascal standard is either only for cold climate or for Europe, et cetera, that's, that's, uh, that's just not true. So these principles that we're gonna discuss in, discuss in a minute and also these certification criteria, they can, be all, um, they can be all applied all over the world and they can be applied for any type of building. So despite the fact that it's called passive house standard, uh, we can also have an office building or a skyscraper, which is a passive house building. Um, in 2015, the Passive House Institute introduced the so-called uh, Passive House classes. And the difference between these uh, Passive House classes or basically why was this introduced in order to differentiate of how much renewable energy is produced on site. Uh, we have the first one is the Passive House Classic and the, um, this one does not have any renewable energy generation. Then the second uh, class that we have is Passive House Plus which uh, should have a, re a renewable primary energy demand below 45 uh, kilowatt hours per square meter annually, and the renewable energy generation should be above 60. Then we have the premium, which is namely that the renewable uh, primary energy demand should be below 30, and then the energy generation be uh, above 120 kilowatt hours per square meter annually. And the certification criteria that we just discussed uh, uh, in the previous slide, they're all valid for these, uh, for all these types. So for all these building types or building classes. Then let's now look into some uh, examples of passive house buildings. Uh, we can have passive house building that is a single family house. As you can see here, uh, we have really beautiful, uh, beautiful houses with flat roofs, right? We, we have any form, any, any form, any shape of the building when we have a passive house building. And um, uh, yeah, people think that, for example, we, we're not allowed to have any, any windows or something like that, but that's, uh, that's not uh, the case. We can have also residential buildings. So here we, you can see we can have row houses, we have uh, big residential blocks. So uh, everything is possible. Also kindergartens and schools, as you can see on the, on the image on, at, the, at the top, we have also quite a dynamic facade of our building and it is still, uh, designed and built according to the Passive House standard. We have also shopping centers and sports centers. We can also have office buildings. And on the left, uh, on the left side of this image, you can see of this, uh, of this slide, you can see the first uh, Passive House uh, skyscraper. 
uh, well, it's considered a skyscraper in, in Australia. So uh, we can also have really tall buildings which are uh, certified as passive house buildings. So let's now look into the passive house design principles. We have five main passive house uh, principles that we follow as guidelines um, in order to make a passive house building. But before that, I want to show you the global map because the passive house standard is a global standard. However, passive houses are designed and built locally. Uh, so we cannot take a passive house building uh, from one country and just bring it to another and expect to perform the same way. We cannot even take a passive house building, uh, for example, uh, from Sydney and then bring it to Melbourne and think, okay, it's going to perform the same way, right? Because everything is different because passive houses are really designed and built locally based on the uh, based on the surrounding buildings, based on the shading uh, in the area, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we really have to focus on, um, on, yeah, on the location of the project. Furthermore, uh, this presentation is for Australia and New Zealand, but as you can see, we have a lot of different climate zones. Uh, so uh, we have really hot and warm climates, we have warm temperate, etc. So uh, the, the U values, the reference values that I'm going to show to you in this slide are reference values for warm and temperate climates. Firstly, the first principle that we have is thermal insulation. So the benefits of having a well thermally insulated building is that we have reduced heat losses and also that we have comfortable interior surface temperatures in the building. Um, the, the main rule of, the rule of thumb is that we ha should have low U values. Uh, in, for warm temperate climates, U values of 0.25 watts per square meter Kelvin are acceptable. And sometimes we can also uh, have slightly higher uh, U values depending on, the, depending on the region that's talking about Australia and New Zealand. And uh, for example, in some zones uh, like Oakland, uh, it is also possible not to have any insulation under the floor slab because this can be really beneficial for uh, and help us to cool down the building. And just to give you a reference of how much insulation is 0.25 watt per square meter Kelvin, uh, that's like 10 to 15 centimeters of, uh, of insulation. And the, the insulation of the past house building, it should go all around the building, right? We should have a single continuous uh, thermal layer. Uh, and again, depending on the climate, we can also have no insulation under the floor slab if that's going to be beneficial for our building. But this, for this, we have to make an energy model of the building and see how it uh, performs, of course. Now let's look into some passive house construction systems. So um, the suitable passive house external wall construction, for, again, for warm temperate climate, should have a U value below 0 0.25 watt per square meter Kelvin. This is only a reference value. So just to explain you how the, the standard works and what the idea of the standard is, basically the only criteria that has to be fulfilled is the certification criteria, right? So we have these, five, uh, these main certification criteria that we discussed in one of the previous slides. And these are the only criteria that we have to fulfill in order to certify a passive house building. Then these U values that we're looking at, they're just reference U values or in other, in other words, they're like guidelines uh, which can help us uh, make decisions, right? And if we follow these guidelines, then we'll achieve the passive house uh, standard criteria. Um, and to give you an example of when would it be acceptable to have, for example, higher U values, um, if we have better windows, right? If we decide, okay, I'm gonna put triple glazing in, in uh, New Zealand, I'm gonna build a building with triple glazing, and then you, you'll be allowed, for example, to have slightly less insulation uh, on the walls. So these are just a few, um, and, and basically as passive house designers, we look at the building as one whole building, right? We don't look at the building as different parts, but we look at the building as one whole building. And that's also what this, the passive house planning package or the PHPP software does. We make an energy model of the whole building, and then we can analyze the building. We can analyze how, much, how thick our insulation should be based on the windows that we use, based on the air tightness of the building, Etc. And then based on that, we can also compare how uh, we can have the most cost optimal design. Because of course, we can put the best windows, we can put the best insulation, uh, vacuum glazing, etc., etc., etc. But then the, the price of the building will skyrocket. And these are all things that we can compare, for example, whether it's going to be more economical to use uh, 
triple glazing and 10 centimeters of insulation or to use double glazing and 15 centimeters of insulation. We'll see what the energy performance of the building is and we'll also see how this affects the price. So let's now go back to the slide. With the passive house standard, we can have any type of building uh, or any type of the construction used for uh, our building. We can have lightweight timber frame structure with cellulose insulation. We can have uh, wood frame uh, wall with the service layer and mineral wall. Um, we can also have insulated concrete formwork or also called ICF. We can have masonry with the exterior um, insulation finishing system. We can have prefabricated concrete elements. We can have also uh, in situ concrete, for example, with XPS. So we have the total freedom to choose any type of construction system, to choose any type of insulation system. The only thing that we have to fulfill are, are the certification criteria. One more thing related to the, the thermal envelope of the building is the so-called form factor, or in our words, also compactness. And uh, this is quite important when we talk about energy efficient buildings in general. So it's not only about passive house buildings, but it, it's about energy efficient buildings. Um, the more compact our building is, the less uh, passive house measures to have to take in order to make the building energy efficient and in order for the building to meet the passive house certification criteria. Now, let me explain it to you in other words. The form factor, this is the ratio of the building envelope area related to the treated floor area, right? The treated floor area is the area that we use inside of the building and that's only the, the open area inside of the building. So it, uh, without the, the, the walls, without the columns, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the treated floor area. And uh, this is, so the form factor is the building envelope area compared to the floor area of the building. We also have the so-called AV ratio, which is the building envelope area related to the volume of the building. And these factors we can use in order to measure the compactness of a building. So the more compact the building is, as I mentioned, the less passive house measures we'll have to take. If, for example, we increase, if we have a 10% increase in the building envelope area, as you can see on, on the picture in the middle, right? So we increase the building envelope area. However, the, the, air, the three to floor area of the building stays the same then we would need to put 70 millimeters of additional insulation in order to compensate for the extra heat losses that we have through the building envelope, right? Because we have the same area, so we're gonna heat up the same area. However, we're gonna lose energy from more, right? We increase the area from which we lose energy. That's why we have to put in more energy in order to compensate for that. But if we wanna have the same performance of the building as in the most compact design, well, in that case, we would wanna put uh, more insulation, for example, like 70 millimeters of insulation. If we increase the building um, envelope area by 20%, well, then we'd have to compensate for the extra heat loss by putting, for example, 150 millimeters of insulation. So the more compact the building is, the less passive house measures we'll have to take in order to meet the certification criteria. So that was the first principle, thermal insulation. The second principle is air tightness. The benefits of air tightness is that it reduces the heat losses through infiltration, it reduces the drafts inside of the building, so it makes a really comfortable building. It reduces the possibility of moisture damage to the building structure, and it also protects the insulation and ensures its uh, effectiveness. The certification criteria, so that's not only a design principle, but it's also a certification criteria, is that the N50 value should be below 0 0.6, that's for every type of climate for every location around the world. What is air tightness actually? Air tightness is the resistance to inward or outward air leakage through the building envelope. This air leakage is driven by differential pressure, uh, uh, differential pressures across the building envelope due to the combined effects of stack, external wind and mechanical ventilation systems. So basically uh, by making an airtight building, we reduce the leakages through the building envelope. The importance of the air tightness is that it is that it protects against condensation inside the structure, it protects against air drafts, uh, it protects from cold floors on the ground floor, uh, it also protects against indoor air pollution, it ensures sound insulation of the building components and ensures the uh, operation and efficiency of the ventilation system as well. 
uh, the air tightness ensures that the insulation effect of the exterior building components is going to be uh, long lasting. And also it reduces the ventilation heat loss, of course. The main rules for designing an airtight building are firstly, the so-called avoidance rule. So we should keep the airtight layer continuous without any penetration. So we should have a single continuous airtight layer around the building. In general, the rule of thumb is that if you take uh, the section of a building and you take a pen, that's the so-called pen rule, you, you have to be able to draw a single continuous line all around the building envelope without taking off the pen. If you take off the pen, this means that you're gonna have a leak uh, in your airtight layer. Then the second rule is the so-called penetration rule. Of course, uh, sometimes we cannot avoid the, pen, uh, the penetrations, right? Whether it's gonna be for the pipes, for the ventilation system or for other duct work, et cetera. So if penetrations of the airtight layer is unavoidable, we should ensure maximum air tightness at the penetration using suitable materials and components. So we have different solutions in order to make these airtight penetrations. And then the last rule of thumb is the so-called connection rule. So the airtight layer and the building component connections merge into each other over the entire surface without uh, interruptions. In other words, we should have a single and continuous airtight layer around our building envelope. What is what should be the right what, or what is the right position of the airtight layer, whether it is inside or outside? The the rule is that the airtight layer should always be on the hot and humid side of the structure. So for cool and temperate climates, uh, the airtight layer should be on the inside because on the inside it's more hot and humid. For hot and humid climates, the airtight layer should be uh, on the outside. So um, yeah, on the outside of our, our of our insulation system. And for, for New Zealand, for example, and also for a bigger part of Australia, the airtight layer is uh, is on the out on the inside, sorry. What is the influence of the air tightness on the heating demand and the heating load of the building? This is a study done by the Passive House Institute, and here you can see uh, the direct correlation between the air tightness and the heating uh, demand and the heating load. So on the left, um, axis we have the space heating demand and the heating load and then on the bottom at the bottom we have the air tightness of the building right starting from zero to 1.5 if you remember the certification criteria is that the building should be 0 0.6 per hour that's the air tight the m50 air tightness uh, and you can see it here in the green line and then the certification criteria for the space heating uh, demand was 15 kilowatt hours per square meter annually and for the heating load it was 10 watts per square meter so you can see then uh, we have the analysis for the air tightness basically the more airtight our building is the lower the heating demand of the building is and also the lower the heating load of the building is and you can see this uh, you can see it based on this uh, on this graph and Air tightness is something that is really often neglected uh, and not taken into account when designing buildings in general, but also when designing energy efficient buildings. Now let's compare the air tightness versus the building code. How much does it cost in order to make a building airtight? So the, uh, this is based on the Passive House Classic that Svetlin designed and built in, in Sofia in Bulgaria. You can see it here on the image. Uh, the additional investment for improving the air tightness of the building compared to the building regulations, right, compared to making the building um, as airtight according to the building regulations, the additional investment was below 900 euros. And we have a saved energy of 3,782 kilowatt hours per year. Uh, so because we have a more airtight building, we have less uh, leakages, less heat losses. That's why we save energy. Um, and an energy price of 11 um, cents per kilowatt hour, the annual savings are 416 euros. This means that the return on the additional investment takes just over two years, after which we save 416 euros every year. So it is not expensive to, to make a building airtight. However, the effect on the energy efficiency and also on the savings and also the return on the additional investment that we make in order to make the building airtight is huge. So the third principle that we're gonna discuss in this lecture is about windows. In Pascal buildings, we use the so-called high performance windows. 
The benefits of having high performance windows are that they reduce the heat losses and maximize the solar heat gains. Uh, we have more natural light uh, through coming in through the windows and we also have more comfortable uh, surface temperatures because um, sometimes you put radiators under the windows right and that's because otherwise we'll have really um, a lot of cold go, um, a lot of um, radiant temperature or really low radiant temperature coming from the window and basically these radiators they create like a heat barrier and this way we have more comfortable temperatures inside. However, with past house buildings, that's, that's totally not needed. Um, to give you some reference of what are high performance windows for Australia and New Zealand, uh, it is acceptable to use uh, double glazing. However, we should use the right so-called low E coatings in the glazing and also the right gas filling. Uh, the, the values that, we, that have to be achieved, uh, that's again, these are reference values for warm temperate climates, are the U value of the window should be below one watt per uh, square meter Kelvin and the G value of the window should be between 0 0.5 and 0 0.6. In some areas in New Zealand, for example, it is acceptable also to have higher U values of the, of the windows. Now, we discussed the U value and the G value, but what do these uh, values actually stand for? The G value, so um, the total energy transmission of the glazing also called the G-value, describes the sum of the energy transmitted from the direct solar radiation and from secondary heat emissions from the outside towards the inside. In other words, the G-value states how much energy can we uh, win or how much energy can we gain through the window, right? That's how much our solar gains are, or also during the summer, they're called sol solar loads. Uh, and the UG-value is an indicator for the transmission heat losses of the glazing. So the UG value shows us how much heat are we going to lose from the inside to the outside. So, so the, the G value is for the solar gains and the UG value is for the heat losses. Then installing properly, uh, to make a proper installation of the window is also extremely crucial for passive house buildings, but also for, um, for energy efficient buildings in general. On the left side of this slide, you can see a standard installation. And on the right side of this slide, you can see an optimized installation of the, of the window. So in other words, on the left, the, our window is installed in the structural layer of the building. If we have masonry, then it's gonna be in the masonry. If we have concrete, it's gonna be installed in the concrete uh, layer. And on the right side, the window is installed in the insulation layer. The, on the left, the additional losses from the thermal breach, so the thermal breach is caused by the, uh, by the heat losses here where uh, the window installation, uh, the additional uh, heat losses are 3.49 watts. The U value of the mounted window is 3.13 watts per square meter Kelvin. And to compare it to the optimized installation, the additional losses from the optimized installation, so through the thermal breach there, are 0 0.06 watts. And the U value of the mounted window, so in the U value of the mounted window, we take into account the U value of the frame, we take into account the uh, U value of the glass, right? So we have the, the frame, we have the glass, we have the, the spacer, so the thermal bridge between the, the glass and the frame. And uh, we also have the installation thermal bridge, right? So where the window uh, is installed, the heat losses through this part of the window. Um, and the U value in the second case is 0 0.84 watts per square meter Kelvin. So the thermal bridge in general, you can see that the thermal bridge of the installation worsens the window characteristics three times, right? So it doesn't matter how good windows, uh, how good our windows are. It doesn't matter how, uh, whether we use vacuum glazing or whatever. Uh, if we don't install the windows properly, then, uh, yeah, then it's just uh, better to um, invest in low quality windows, right? Because uh, you can see that this is the same window, the, the window on the left is the same as the window on the right. And then the, the, term, the heat losses through the window on the left are three times higher than the heat loss through the window on the right. That's why um, optimized installation of the window is extremely important. And then when we talk about windows, 
we should talk also about shading, especially in uh, New Zealand and, uh, and Australia. So uh, you can see that during the, uh, the summer, the sun is quite low and during the, uh, or sorry, during the summer, the sun is quite high and during the winter, the sun is, goes really low. Uh, also on the east and the west side of um, when the sun is on the east or the west, it is quite, quite low as well. And this affects our, uh, the way we should design our shading systems. So, we have firstly shading objects, right? We can have horizontal objects. Uh, for example, if we have a house, a building or, or something else on, for example, on the other side of the street, this would be a horizontal shading object that uh, we don't have direct influence on. And then we also have vertical sh shading objects like uh, balconies or overhangs, or for example, the lintel above the window is also an example for a vertical shading object. This one should be also taken into account when we design the shading systems. And we have lateral shading elements or shading objects, which are, uh, for example, the window reveals or the objects on the, on the side of the building. So these were the shading objects. Let's now look into the shading principles. We have, we differentiate between three different facades when we talk about shading elements or shading principles. Firstly, we have the north facade. That's again for the southern hemisphere of the world. Uh, in that case, we need horizontal shading elements. Uh, these are like balconies, overhangs, uh, the horizontal lamella, etc., etc. Why do we need horizontal shading elements? Well, because the sun is really high. In, uh, so on the north, the sun is really high. That's why we need horizontal shading. Then on the east and the west side of our building, we need vertical shading elements. Why so? Because if that's our building, at the east, the sun comes really low. That's why if we have horizontal shading, the sun is still going to come into the solar gains are still going to come into the building. That's why we need vertical uh, shading elements on the east and the west side of the building. These are, for example, vertical lamellas or screens, as you can see on the image, uh, etc. And then on the south side of our building, we don't need any shading uh, elements because we don't have any uh, solar gains there. Um, different types of shading elements are overhangs, screens, lamellas, adaptable shading, uh, and uh, trees are also perfect seasonal uh, shading. So during the winter, the trees don't have any leaves and they let the solar light going into the building. And during the, um, during the summer, the trees have the leaves on and they don't let the solar light to come into the building. On these images, you, you can see uh, for example, the uh, Albahar towers on the bottom left of the screen, uh, which are in uh, the United Arab Emirates. And this is a beautiful example of adaptive, of adaptive shading elements. At the top right, you can see the Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, which is certified uh, as a passive house building. And it has really advanced shading system, as you can see. Uh, in that case, uh, lamellas have been used. Then at the bottom right, you can see uh, the the vertical shading element, and this is the patch house that Svetlin designed and built. So the third principle was about windows. Then the fourth principle, the fourth design principle that we have in passive house buildings is about thermal bridges. The benefits of having a thermal bridge free design are that we reduce the heat losses, we have comfortable surface temperatures, and there is no risk of mold and condensation. Um, the rule of thumb is that the thermal, a thermal bridge free construction is when the Psi value is below 0 0.01 watts per meter Kelvin. Uh, the Psi value is the value that we use uh, to measure the thermal bridge. What are the thermal bridges and what types of thermal bridges do we have? Firstly, we can differentiate be, uh, between thermal bridges based on their linearity. We have linear thermal bridges, which are measured uh, in the, with the Psi value. This is the value that you can see uh, on the slide. And then we also have punctual thermal bridges, which are measured with the He value. Uh, and for example, the, the linear thermal bridges would be a balcony. Uh, that's, uh, that's the one that you can see on the image on the right, the first image on the right. Um, when the floor slab of the balcony just penetrates the wall, right, and it's continuous, and then we have the punctual, an example for a thermal, a punctual thermal bridge would be uh, if the balcony is fixed only at two points, right? So we have a separate balcony slab 
and this balcony slab is connected only at two points to the uh, to our structure. Um, another example for punctual thermal bridges are the curtain wall facade anchors. And then we also differentiate between uh, uh, the thermal bridges based on their dimensions, whether we calculate the thermal bridge based on the exterior dimensions or based on the internal dimensions, right? Uh, these are di two different methods. For the passive house buildings, we calculate the thermal bridges based on the exterior dimensions. Then we can also differentiate uh, the thermal bridges based on their ge geometry. So we have geometrical, uh, that's when the, there's change in the thickness, for example, of the material, of the insulation material. That's if we have a difference between the internal and the external areas, or for example, at the corners where we usually have a bit more insulation, um, et cetera. And then um, we have the structural uh, thermal bridges. Uh, that's when the insulation layer is basically interrupted. You can see it at the bottom image of this uh, slide. And on the left, we have change in the thickness, right? We have a different thickness of the insulation system. And then on the right side, you can see the, the structural uh, thermal bridge, or in our words, the interruption of our thermal layer, and that's causing a thermal bridge. And last but not least, uh, we, we can differentiate the thermal bridges based on their conductivity. So we can have positive thermal bridges and negative thermal bridges. Uh, if we have a negative thermal bridge, this does not mean that we're gonna win uh, energy in one or another way. It just means that we lose less energy through the thermal bridges compared to the opaque building envelope. The effect, what is the effect of the thermal bridges on the energy efficiency of a building? So, this is again based on the passive house that's Fetlin designed and built. If this passive house uh, was designed according to the building code, then the uh, specific values for the space heating demand or the, the loss through the thermal bridge would be 70 kilowatt hours per square meter annually. That's how, how much energy we would need in order to compensate for the heat losses through the thermal bridges. However, after optimizing the design, after making a thermal bridge free design, again, the thermal bridge free design is considered when the C value or the heat value is below, below 0.01 watts per, per meter Kelvin. Um, when we optimized the design, the result was that the uh, effect of the thermal bridge was minus one kilowatt hours per square meter annually. So it has a positive effect on our uh, en on the energy balance of the building. Is it expensive? The next question, right? It, Obviously, it is more energy efficient, but is it expensive? In that case, the additional investment for making a thermal bridge free design was around 1,350 euros. And the saved energy is 10,792 kilowatt hours per year. With the energy price of 11 cents per kilowatt hour, the yearly savings are 1,187 euros. This means that the return on the additional investment takes less than a year and a half after which we'll be saving 1,887 euros every single year. So the, the, that's of course in, the, in that case, but thermal bridges can be avoided by making a proper design, by taking the details, making proper details, etc. And then the last part, the last principle that we have is about the mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. So, the benefits of the ventilation system with heat recovery are that it reduces the heat losses, that it delivers fresh air, fresh and clean air in the whole building throughout the whole year, and it also can control the humidity inside of the building. Uh, in past house buildings, we can have either a heat recovery ventilation or energy recovery ventilation. We're going to discuss um, the, what the difference is in the coming slides, uh, and the 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 criteria for this component are that the electrical consumption should be below 0.45 watt hours per cubic meter and that the heat recovery efficiency, the heat recovery rate of the ventilation system should be above 75%. What is the role of the mechanical ventilation system with heat recovery? The main role is to exchange the indoor, the indoor air because as you already saw, the first four principles by combining all these first four principles, we create an extremely high performance building envelope, right? We have the thermal insulation, then we have the, the windows, we make the building really airtight, we also fix the thermal bridges, and then 
there's not going to be any point from which the air is going to be coming into the building, just like it is in standard buildings, right? Standard building, we have just infiltration and exfiltration, and that's how usually the air is ventilated. However, that's not the case with the passive house buildings. That's why we need a ventilation system. It delivers fresh air, it can control the humidity, it reduces the concentration of harmful substances in the air, uh, it controls also the odor. So if we have some odors in the kitchen or in the bathroom, they're not going also to the other parts of the building in the other rooms. And it also reduces the heat losses from the ventilation system, right? Uh, in general, with the Pascal standard, we want to reduce the heat losses in every possible way. And that's why we also want to reduce the heat losses through the ventilation system. The additional role of the ventilation system uh, can be for air conditioning, uh, like air purification, by using filters. It can be also for heating and cooling. So we can use the ventilation system in order to heat or cool down our building. We'll look into these principles in a minute. And we can also extract moisture from the building. In passive house buildings, we, we use the so-called cross ventilation principle. So we don't deliver and extract air in the same room. Rather, we deliver uh, air in one room and we, we extract it from the other room. As you can see here, we have a supply air zone, we have a transfer air zone, and we also have an extract air zone. So we deliver the air into the supply air zone. These are like living rooms, bedrooms, offices, guest rooms, etc. So the rooms in which we spend more time. Then the air is being transferred through the corridors or the staircases. Uh, and that's done through transfer openings, whether uh, it's whether we're going to cut the door slightly underneath or above the lint of the door, or we have transfer openings also in the wall, etc. And then the air is transferred to the extract air zone. So these are kitchens, toilets, bathrooms, technical rooms, storages. And there we extract the air. And with this cross ventilation principle, the, the, the main rule is that there should be always something happening with the air in every single room of the building. And what is the difference between the heat recovery ventilation and the energy recovery ventilation? So the heat recovery ventilation transfers heat from the extract to the intake air. Um, it is suitable for mild and temperate climates and there is also no transfer of gases, odors and contaminants as well. On the other hand, we have the energy recovery ventilation. The, this one transfers not only heat, but also moisture from the extract air to the intake air. It is suitable for all climates, especially for cool uh, temperate and also for hot and humid climates. In other words, the energy recovery ventilation, also called uh, ventilation, uh, entropy vent uh, ventilation system, uh, basically it either helps us to keep the high moisture outside, right? Because it's gonna recover the moisture and the moisture is gonna stay outside of the building. Or if outside it is really dry and cold, in that case, we'll have the high moisture inside of the building. And by recovering the moisture, the moisture all the moisture is gonna stay inside of the building. Um, the energy recovery ventilation maintains the humidity difference between inside and outside. And that's how it does it with the humidity recovery. And again, there's no transfer of gases, odors and contaminants. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see how the air is being transferred uh, through this uh, heat recovery unit. Basically, the outdoor air comes in, then, it the, then the heat is transferred from the extract air to the outdoor air. So they're without being mixed, right? We have different pipes going like that. I'll just show it to you like that. And then here we have the extract air and here we have the outdoor air and they're just... Um, um, there is heat transfer and also possible humidity transfer through membranes. And then uh, this way we have filtered air that comes into the building, uh, fresh, clean air, uh, etc. And also we minimize the heat losses. So heating in passive house buildings. We can use any type of heating system in a passive house building. So uh, there are no prescriptive requirements for heating and cooling generation and distribution systems. Uh, the heating system should be selected by the design team and the Pascal standard even gives us the possibility to have more um, options for heating, right? Because we can use uh, the ventilation system, we can connect the heating coil to the ventilation system and use this one as a heating system. Uh, we, and of course, we can use direct heating, any kind of heat pumps, etc. Um, 
So any kind of heat generation is also possible, whether it's going to be district heating, whether it's going to be boilers or a heat pump or active solar heating, uh, electric heating, etc. So um, in passive house buildings, by designing a passive house building and having a really low heating load, it is possible to use the air in order to distribute the heat. And by connecting an air-to-air -air heat pump to the ventilation system or connecting a heating or a cooling coil, we can um, use the ventilation system as a distribution system for our heating. However, bear in mind that we should have the uh, low heating and or cooling loads in order to be, for this to be possible. Then cooling. How do we cool passive house buildings? Well, we have, firstly, we'll look into passive cooling. Uh, we can have solar control or in our words also shading in order to cool down the building in or, or in our words to minimize the uh, heat loads in the building. We can use night ventilation by opening the windows. Uh, we can use the thermal mass of the building, right? This can have slight influence on the cooling demand of the building in the warm climates. We can have a heat recovery ventilation with the summer bypass, which means that if the outdoor air is uh, cold enough, then we can have the outdoor air directly coming into the building without going through the heat recovery unit. And we can also reduce the internal heat loads. If we cannot use passive cooling because of one or another reason, whether it's because outside is way too warm or the ground is too warm, then we should use an active cooling system. Active cooling systems are air to air heat pumps, cooling coil, etc. It is important for the cooling case to differentiate between sensible and latent cooling. So sensible cooling is when the space is cooled by decreasing the temperature. In other words, uh, that's just by decreasing the temperature. And latent cooling is when the moisture content in the space is decreased or in other words, dehumidification. So when we talk about cooling, we should think about cooling and dehumidification as well. Some active cooling units where we have a cooling coil, mini split unit, a duct system, cold ceilings, everything is possible. And here you can see a dehumidification uh, device. So this one, uh, for dehumidification, we either use dehumidifiers, which is the one that you can see on the image, or we use uh, humidity recovery ventilation, or also called the uh, energy recovery ventilation. And now last but not least, economics of the passive house building. So the passive house building finds the most optimal design uh, the, comparing the investment costs in energy efficiency measures and also the energy costs of the building. So you can see that if we make really energy efficient buildings, we're barely going to have any energy costs. However, our initial investment is going to be really high. And that's also uh, where we increase our total cost. On the other hand, if we don't invest in energy efficiency, we're going to have really high energy costs throughout the years. And this will also increase the total cost of the or the life cycle cost of the building as well. So with the passive house standard, we're looking for this dip, as you can see in the graph, we're looking for the most cost optimal design. Here, you can see the PHPP results and the certification of the passive house building that Svetlin designed and built. Uh, it has been certified as a passive house classic. And based on that, we did a study. So we wanted to compare what the different steps are so we made the Pascal standard step by step by implementing all the different design principles that we just discussed. And we wanted to see what is the effect of these design principles on the economics of the building and also on the heating uh, demand and the energy performance of the building. And here you can see that in 30 years, this is the, for the passive house building. And the second one is for the uh, building uh, built according to the building code. So you can see that a building which is made for uh, a passive house building, the return on the investment is really high, right? For 30 years, the passive house building is much more cheaper compared to the building uh, built according to the building code. And then when we wanted to see, okay, what is the return on the investment? That's uh, going to be for seven years. So within seven years, the additional investment for the passive house building in that case um, is going to happen, right? So it only takes seven years to uh, get the return on investment. And after that, we're only going to save throughout the life cycle of the building. So these were guys, this was guys about the passive house principles. I guess there was a lot of information, um, but I hope it was really useful for you. Just to tell you a bit more about the passive house school, 
We, as already mentioned, we are building certifiers so we can certify passive house buildings. We can also uh, be consultants for your project in order to make the passive house, uh, to make your project according to the passive house standard. Uh, we also have calculate thermal bridges and we also have a lot of passive house courses. And recently, a few weeks ago, we released the passive house 101 course. That's an introduction course about the passive house standard. We're going to cover the things that we just discussed, but also much, much more. There are going to be more than seven hours of lectures. We have also 100 questions. We're going to help you solidify your learnings. Uh, you're also going to get certificate of, of completion, etc. And there is also a 30% discount available for the first few people who register for this uh, course. And in order to get the discount, you can use the first 50 uh, coupon code on the checkout. And the course is 116 uh, US dollars. So thank you very much for attending this webinar. And now I suggest to move into the Q&A session. So, uh, hi, Andon. Uh, we have a few questions lined up. Yeah. So uh, the first question is from uh, Mr. Ian Jones. Uh, so, he he's actually interested in the idea that uh, uh, his elect like he's wondering whether uh, driving an electric car contributes towards uh, certifying a house as um, a plus passive house classic because uh, the car um, it it contributes towards the energy uh, the total energy consumed by the house but wherein he is uh, reducing the damage to the environment I guess that's what he has meant by his question. So um, the passive house standard is uh, purely focuses on the energy efficiency of the building, right? So with the, when we have a passive house building, uh, we focus on the energy efficiency of only the building. We have other standards like LEED, for example, which focus on a lot of different things. But with passive house buildings, we only look at the building and uh, how the building performs. Is it, uh, is it clear? And in other words, to, to directly answer your question, no, it does not make a difference whether we have an, a standard car or whether we have an electric car. So uh, I was just wondering whether ha uh, recharging an electric car um, would count as an additional cost, uh, additional energy cost on the building if uh, the house is, while considering certification of the house, like, if uh, having an electric car in an already classic certified passive house um, cause uh, make it to be uh, like make it not a passive house. Svetling? If you use an electrical car, uh, you'll have uh, more consumption for the primary energy, more primary energy consumption, and it will reflect on the uh, last criteria that uh, Anton mentioned, but you can compensate this by adding some uh, renewables, okay? More renewable generation to compensate. Yeah, so, so basically we discussed the different certification criteria, right? We had the criteria for the space heating demand or the heating load. We have the space cooling demand. We had the criteria about the air tightness and we also had a criteria about the primary energy renewable. And by having an additional consumer in the building for the en an additional energy consumer, which in that case is the car, this would reflect the, um, the energy consumption of the building, or in other words, it would reflect the so-called PER demand. Uh, however, for this, as Fetley mentioned, we can compensate by renewables on site. And it also, um, uh, but, but yeah, but in general, there is no direct, uh, let's say, requirement for having an electric car or something like that. So the passive house standard is concentrated uh, on the building efficiency. Uh, that's the most important thing. Uh, that's the most uh, precise metho methodology of calculating the uh, energy efficiency of the buildings. And uh, the results that we've got are very near to the, uh, to the performance after that uh, of the buildings. For example, in my house, uh, 
uh, the pre-calculated with the software results uh, are covered after I live mo there more than three years and I see that uh, I've got less consumption which is very close to the pre-calculated and that's the that's the big plus of the passive house uh, methodology. Sweet, thanks. I hope we answered your question, Ian. And uh, the next question is from Rosie. So she asks, uh, hi, Anton, uh, you mentioned that you can use any thermal envelope buildup in order to meet the passive house criteria. Do you need to demonstrate you won't get industrial condensation in your buildup? How does the passive house assessment criteria deal with this? Svetlin? Yeah, Svetlin. You're, you're yeah. muted. Quick. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. So, depending on the climate zone, everything, de uh, as Santon uh, told you, uh, when you design a passive house, you have to take into account all the specifics of the climate zone and also of the, uh, of the, of the plot. Uh, for, it is uh, a huge difference if you make a passive house uh, design in a cold climate, uh, or hot and warm or warm climate. Uh, it depends also on the humidity of the climate. If you've got a very hot and uh, warm cli and uh, humid, humid climate, yeah, uh, the, the strategies that you are going to use are totally different than uh, making a passive house in cold and uh, uh, dry climate. Uh, so, so there are different approaches you can uh, Design, uh, you have to know uh, how to design this, uh, your uh, building, and you, you can use PHPP to see the real results that you can expect, yeah? And in other words, if you have to fix this problem, if, you, if there's a chance, firstly, depending on the climate, if there's a chance that there's gonna be condensation in your building structure, then of course you have to fix that because the, otherwise the performance of the building is not gonna be long lasting and durable, right? And that's what we're going, aiming for. So you're going to make calculations for where the condensation in your buildup is going to be. And based on that, you have to decide where uh, you have to put the vapor barrier in order to minimize the vapor content or the moisture content in the buildup and to, uh, mi to minimize the chances of condensation. But this is, again, really climate specific the, and location specific as well. Sweet. Uh, so because we are running out of time, one last question from Jay. So he's asking, uh, what's more effective, uh, whether it is cavity wall or insulation wall? And uh, I think he's asked, uh, he means, uh, what do we do with the heat that comes from the floor? Um, yeah. So in general, uh, the floor should be insulated, right? And by having insulation all around the building, we minimize the heat, uh, the heat losses or also the heat loads, uh, which would come from the, through the ground. If the ground temperature is low enough, uh, then we can also put less insulation or even no insulation under the floor slab because this would help us with the cooling case because if the, if the ground temperature is low, then we would have heat losses from the building through the, to the ground and this way would cool down the building during the summer. That's a really, really specific case. And whether it is uh, more effective to use a cavity wall or, or an insulation wall, um, uh, so in any case, firstly, in any case, you, you, you have to use insulation, uh, depending on whether you have any uh, uh, chances of problems with moisture and condensation in the buildup, um, you should decide what kind of insulation you want to use. And also probably what of an effect this will have is on your uh, treated floor area, right? So depending on how thick your insulation is, depending on how big the insulation wall is, this can minimize or maximize your floor area. So these are also things that you have to take into account. Uh, but in general, you can use any type of, uh, of system and dep it depends on the climate, uh, which system is the best for you. Again, depending on whether you have problems with condensation or not. Um, and yeah, also talking about even the, only about New Zealand, there's a huge difference in the climate within New Zealand, right? And one insulation system might be acceptable in one area in New Zealand, like Oakland, uh, but it's not going to be acceptable in, uh, for example, Wellington. Sweet. Um, thanks, Andon, for answering all the questions. Uh, by the way, uh, 
any of you, if you have any more questions, you could get in touch with the speakers using the email IDs that's mentioned. And you could also have a look at the course which Andon mentioned. Um, yeah, you can, so, you can go to, to our website. It's PassiveHouseSchool.com. And there you'll find the Passive House 101 course if you're interested. Sweet. Um, so we, we could wind up now. And a special thanks to Svetlin and Andon for showing up and sharing your invaluable knowledge with all of us. Thank you, guys. And, uh, thank you very but, much. As well. Thank you very much as well. And thanks for and, organizing it. Oh, no worries. And uh, last but not the least, I would like to thank all the attendees um, for attending the event you got, uh, and for making it a success. And uh, every one of you will be getting a CPD certificate and uh, the recording of this webinar in your email within a week's time. Thank you, and you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.